Hello, feel good fathers. Man, today's a huge day. I'm ecstatic to be here with you to celebrate the fact that one year ago, feel good fatherhood started. It was launched. A dream, a passion, something that Jay really wanted to see other fathers impacted to make a difference not only personally in who they were, but also in their family and the future generations. So I want to take a moment to just acknowledge we've this has been something that's gone on for a year, over 50 episodes in podcasting. A lot of podcasts don't make it past seven to 10 episodes. They fade out. There's been sacrifices. There's been time that's had to be shifted, different things to make each of these episodes, you know, occur for us to be able to enjoy, sit back and learn and take that knowledge and then apply it to our own life. And so I want to acknowledge this milestone, this celebration for Jay, for us being able to learn from him. And, uh, Dude, Jay, congratulations. This is this is amazing because I remember talking about even the idea, the dream of feel good fatherhood. And here we are a year later, man. You have you have made this happen and invested and really poured into it. And just congratulations, man. Thanks, dude. I I appreciate it so much. You know, I, I I've really been serving men in some capacity since my days in college when uh, I was a dating coach. Uh, I call it confidence coaching now. And, and really that's what I was doing was helping young men just really figure out how to navigate early romance and develop a much more outgoing and stand up guy sort of personality. And today, you know, some of those lessons apply, you know, it's, it's really good to have be more outgoing, uh, a little bit more entertaining, have a little more um, uh, elements and stories to, to, to do, to go through and really present your best foot forward. But there's this other side to men, and that is this wonderful journey of fatherhood. And so as I'm kind of getting older, I knew I, I don't want to talk about that stuff. <laughs> you know, you know, it's not, I, I don't have a lot of interest going back and doing that, but I have a tremendous amount of interest discovering and sharing and documenting this journey of what it's like to be a father, this, what I, what I really consider the culmination of what is the human male experience that the top of that pyramid is literally being a patriarch, being the father, being a grandfather and having a family that extends into generations. I don't know if there's anything higher than that honor. And so it's really been uh, my selfish reason for Feel Good Fatherhood is that I want to learn from the best of the best. Mm -hmm. I want to learn from other fathers that are doing their thing. I want to have conversations about different elements, policies, situations, statistics that are affecting men and fathers, because I know at the end of the day, we all get better. Our families get better. Our kids get better. And all of that starts by personal, taking radical personal responsibility, which is the feel good fatherhood way. And that does extend to moms in case you're wondering out there, moms, women, that's something like you're in it, but my audience happens to be men and fathers. And so that's really what feel good father is about. Um, it's really my mission. It's not going anywhere. I intend to do this for forever. And I want to thank you so much for challenging me and encouraging me and mike has been with me the entire time like we text all the time we've developed this really great relationship and i know that when i have questions or i have things i need to accomplish mike is one of the men that i lean on in my life for what's going on and so thank you thank you for being here and thank you for being a part for of of year one our year in review dude it's absolutely my honor and privilege and i was blown away when you were like hey do you want to jump on here and do this uh Absolutely. Yes. hundred percent. Let's go do it now. Cause I remember the two of us meeting over ribs at an Airbnb and it was like, Hey, you're, you're a gamer too. And yet you want to do this and you're passionate about men and how we can impact future generations and helping us not realize like we feel we're the only one going through these struggles. It was like, 
where you been? <laughs> so I think that common thread was what pulled us together and uh, just really continue to forge things that and our, our love for dad jokes. And so I'm going <laughs> to jump in here and ask you, man, what's like your favorite dad joke at this point? So this is classic, classic story in the Twining house. Uh, so, you know, one day, you know, my wife comes home and, you know, the, the, the lights are off, it's a little bit dark and she's walking to the kitchen and she's hearing this murmur coming from the oven. And I don't know if, if, if you're anything like me I, or if you're like her, you're, you're probably a little bit surprised, like what's happening, Where what's this murmur? And so she's, you know, she kind of comes over, she sees that the oven's on, stuff like that. She's kind of like, oh, you know, the, you know, dad, you know, Jay must be baking. It's, it's going on. So she, she kind of opens it up to check on and, and see what's going on. And, you know, there's that oven light. So she's flicking that on. And then she sees that there's like just kind of two muffins hanging out in the oven. And, uh, you know, and they're just kind of squawking around and being the curious person that she is, she kind of opens it up. And, you know, one of the muffins is sweating as, as muffins sweat when they're in the oven. And it's like, man, it's getting real hot in here. And then the, you know, the other muffin just says, oh my God, a talking muffin. <laughs> I can appreciate the muffins because it's like part of my morning routine is jumping in a sauna. Yeah. So I'll just say that's my muffin time. <laughs> that is, ah, that's, so, that's so great. The, the sauna, the sauna world. Uh, that's yes. definitely in, in the, uh, in the queue for, for the workout room here. Oh, dude. I mean, all things in, in time, but yeah, having, having those goals of what you want to do. And then making sure you're taking care of yourself. Like that's a learned process for me. Uh, and I continue to look for it, but dude, it makes such a difference. Just investing that time, especially when we don't have the time. But I uh, absolutely 100% agree. Cause yeah. what, what I know is that, especially when we're in crisis, when we're going through something in our life that it sometimes feel like we have to sacrifice these habits or routines that are helping us become and be the person that we are. And at any given moment, right, there's there's a handful of different things that men and fathers are going through that we're really all going through. Uh, there's the first category that I call the self-imposed issue. These are like internal mindset, emotional, spiritual crisis, that kind of stuff. And then there's the more external, physical, tangible crisis, which is a lot of what I sort of went through, and I'm, I'm using crisis very loosely. It's just big, significant events that are happening in your life. So this year, we moved from upstate New York to Nashville. Uh, last year, right around in October, we had a new baby. Uh, other kinds of crisis here that also show up, job stress, um, and something that we all don't really like to acknowledge, but holiday stresses can, can be this issue. And so I think it's just really important for the feel good father community to know that we just, we all have issues. We all have things that are going on and that just kind of happens. But the big categories for men that we're dealing with are mental health, right? Emotional intelligence, being able to express our emotions. Uh, I, we're, you and I have had a conversation where it's bullshit that people out there are saying that men don't have emotions. That's just categorically untrue. However, men may not express their emotions or they may not decide to articulate them. And that's, that's not necessarily okay. And so that's something that we can get into that just a little bit later on. Suicide is a huge, huge issue for men yes. in men's life. Um, uh, I don't even want to get into the, the statistics because it's absolutely heartbreaking. And uh, one of the largest groups that's at, at risk for uh, suicide is veterans. And we know that it's a huge percentage of men that are serving in the, in the military, um, or some sort of, uh, security, what I call like enforcement, right? The ex executive branch of the government. So police, um, you know, FBI, that kind of, you know, military in some, some capacity, the protection and security, uh, industry, um, other things that men, uh, deal with a lot more is, uh, poverty and incarceration. So the vast majority of things like 90% of all people incarcerated in the U S are men, um, that might actually be higher, but it's it's super high. And then poverty, uh, something that is not very well discussed. But if you go to the IRS statistics, the the bottom of the population distribution as far as poverty, it's majority men. And so it's just um, these are just kind of things that are just unique, unique to men uh, as far as like the issues that we're we're talking about. 
Uh, but all of this really, all of this really, when it comes down to what Feel Good Father is about, because we are not necessarily about solving all the men's issues. We're here to talk about fatherhood and raising kids and raising your family. And that's what this is about. But the, the statistic that really breaks my heart, that really drives me forward, and I pay attention to a lot. And if, you, and if you're a Feel Good Father listener and you know this and you've heard me talk, it's about fatherless households. Mm-hmm. One third of all kids grow up in a single or fewer parents in the household, biological parents. One third, that's by the U.S. Census. So let's just think about that mm-hmm. for just a minute. One out of every three kids has one or fewer parents in the house. And we know that by fatherless households, majority of those are going to be fathers that are not in the house. And that can be, that can be a, a responsibility side where they've noped out. That can be, hey, they've passed because they're in, you know, maybe they've been in the military or, you know, actually men, men tend to die pretty young as well. <laughs> so yeah. there's lots of different issues there uh, when it comes down to it. So when it comes to all these different issues that we've talked about, when it comes to men's health and men's issues, a lot of them are internal and the people that suffer from them, they do need help. And so if you have it in your heart to do so, to help them out, please do so. Uh, and so we call that the capacity here in feel good fatherhood, being able to lend a hand to people that are not biologically related to you and helping them. That's what real masculinity and fathers fatherhood is all about. We want to have a better society. Men that have the capacity have to reach out to those that don't have fathers and be an extra father to them. Because we all know it takes a village. It takes a village to raise a person. Yeah. And it's uncomfortable, right? It's an uncomfortable thing to do because it's like, I could look at you, Jay, and go, man, I, I'm i in this situation. I need to chat with somebody to talk things through. It's uncomfortable on both sides. You know, you going, oh, crud, what is Mike going to say? And for me going, how is Jay going to react? But if we don't do that, the relationships that like you and I have, don't form you know it's like um the statistics also show that we have less friends as males than we used to before which is a dangerous thing because then it's like okay i already have a hesitancy to talk about it now there's fewer guys that i'm talking to about it um you know it's like looking you and i have had multiple times to talk about where you've kind of uh the path you've gone right in saying hey i'm going to be intentional about being the best man i can be and a great father and that was something you learned along the way what when you look back over this past year so when you you know one year ago when you launched feel good fatherhood you look at the who you were as a dad then and you look at where you're at now what would you say is like the first thing that jumps out to you? This is obvious that it changed because of the interviews, uh, the, the men that you've talked to, the women that you've talked to about fatherhood and how to show up as a better dad. Like what's the first thing that pops to your mind? Oh, that's such a great question. I really think it's as you articulated, we as men, view it as a sign of weakness that we're asking for help. This is that classic joke, right? You're driving around with your wife. She's got the map map out and she's like, I I I think we want to turn left there. And the man is like, no, no, it's it's, it's two rights ahead. We got to do it. You know? And so that is the caricature of the situation. And it's, it's, it's funny. It's really funny that, that we do that. But I think that um, what it really takes is this this balance of certainty and uncertainty. And what I've seen really from, uh, especially from these high performers that I've been working for, these experts and these these people that have their businesses or their entrepreneurship or, or their particular path or meaning or charitable foundation that they're running, that they have decided that they're going to be great at one or two things. This is in the same way that, you know, I'm really great at branding. I'm really great at marketing. That's what I do right now. I'm actually really great at product management. So there's a handful of things that I'm really great at and I'm developing the skill of being a better interviewer, being a better facilitator of discussion, uh, solving problems, being this great podcaster. 
and moving through and have that discipline to develop that skill. It means, it also means that I, there's some things I don't know how to do and I might need help. When we look at top performers, when we look at the experts in the world, when we look at the great people, they're not doing it by themselves. And I think the number one thing I'm learning from just talking to all these fathers is that they're just, they're not doing it by themselves. Why the hell are we? It's crazy. It's, it's just crazy. Uh, and that's not really this overt criticism. It's It should be a learning, right? It should be this idea that, hey, there's somebody out there that may or may not be reaching out an olive branch to you. And a, and a big thing that we have to be able to do and be intentional about is know when we can pick that up. Know when uh, we can grab that olive branch by the hands and just allow somebody to help us out. And so that really the the core core piece of that is in part of the learning section uh, of something I'd like to talk about today. But I think really at first to kind of highlight feel good fatherhood, feel good fatherhood really has a handful of like principles, identity, uh, who you are and how you show up, curiosity. It's a way to navigate the world in different situations, fidelity, which really means ego and approaching life from a service perspective. Uh, or as we like to say, face your wife, face your house, face your kids. Learning, which is how you develop those new hard and soft skills. Emotion, which is having some sort of emotional, I don't like the term emotional intelligence because it's loaded, but emotional literacy, knowing what you're feeling, why you're feeling it, and what you can do about it. And then relationships, just simple frameworks, simple ideas, but what are, what are different relationships? What are the relationships you need in your life? And have some understanding about that. Because there is actually a science, an art and a science to each of those pieces. When it comes to really reflecting on this last year, identity and learning, that's where we're going to deep dive. So, uh, and before we jump in there, right, uh, what we need to understand is that through all these conversations, that a lot of these fathers that I was talking to, or that I've talked to just in passing, when they find out what I'm about at conferences, that kind of stuff, they always ask me, like, how do I get ahead? How do I grow my expertise? How do I go from an entrepreneur and grow that business and like that? And as we discussed, I'm this brand strategist and I'm this podcaster and professionally, I work for Brand Builders Group. That's a globally renowned eight-figure firm. So I help experts grow their business through the reputation. We call that personal branding. So if you're one of those fathers and you're looking to grow your impact, your reach, and attract more clients, request the free brand strategy call. And go ahead and go to jtwining.com slash free brand call. There'll be a link as well down in the description of this. And so if you, um, this is that ca capacity as an entrepreneur and expert, that's how you can help people professionally show up in a bigger way, develop that brand, understand what you're, what you're all about. And just to clue you in, this is what Mike and I have been talking about. Feel Good Fatherhood began from this effort. I have a brand. I'm working on my own brand. And this is what I'm bringing into the world in addition to that brand strategy work. So I'm super excited and I really want to kind of get things going. So as a kid, when I was young, when I was in elementary school, I think some of my earliest memories were tinkering, tinkering with BASIC or DOS prompt, which is like old computer programming lingo, right? And I would build little adventures. I play text adventures, build little games. And I, I just always wanted to be a video game developer. And as a kid, it's like, okay, well, if I want to do that, got to get good at tech, got to get good at math, got to get good at this kind of stuff. And there's this path, but always in my head, I just kept telling myself, oh, okay, I want to be a video game designer. Oh, okay. I want to be a video game designer. And here's the crazy thing that happened was that halfway through college, going through programming. And let me tell you, when I met some real programmers and some real computer engineers and that kind of stuff, I realized that's not my skill set. <laughs> so <laughs> I was good at product management. I was great at analytics and decent at project management. So I could have the vision, communicate the vision, get a team together to create it and ideate through different things to do. But I almost gave up on that dream in college. And so I, I did that. I kind of left the industry, left that dream, went into regular analytics, ended up working 
at uh, at a tech firm and I was doing uh, just analytics. That's the best way. I was just taking numbers, producing KPIs, spitting that out to my the people I reported to. You know, how's your father? That's it. <laughs> That's what I did. But one thing that occurred that I absolutely love was that one day I was looking around and a and a good <laughs> a good mentor of mine at the time, uh, definitely thematic for this discussion, Michael Sparrow. Uh, was talking to me about being challenged. And he's like, hey, he turned to me one day and he was like, I can kind of tell you're bored and I can tell there's something else that you want to do with your life. And I'm paraphrasing this discussion, uh, but he said, have you ever given a thought to what it is that you actually want to do? And I was like, okay. So that happened and I was kind of wrestling with that whole thing. And then one day um, there was a pen and paper game that I always played. And it was uh, Riffs, which is a Palladium Books pen and paper. When you're thinking about dice rolling and uh, tabletop gaming, there's there's three brands that are at the top, the top three. Dungeons and Dragons, which has like 95% market share. Then there's Pathfinder, which has like 3% market share. Then there's Palladium Books, which has basically the next largest market share. And what I didn't know was that while I was living in Detroit at the time, I didn't know that actually they were down the street. They were literally 50 minutes from me. And that year they happened to have their first, what they were calling the open house. And so you get to go into the office, go into basically their warehouse where all of these books are on crates and boxes. And we had this conference. So I have some original art, all this kind of stuff. And the founder, his name was Kevin Sembeda. And we're, I go to this conference, go through the whole thing. And we're doing a book signing. And I had one of the originals. I had one of the original first book, the the core riffs, pen and paper RPG thing. And I was getting it signed. And then every once in a while, there's these happenstance, coincidental conversations. So he says to me, he says, hey, hey, Jay, I'm going to sign this, but uh, what do you want to do with your life? (laughs) So what I do is I say, and I, this is a pure stream of consciousness. I said, you know, I've always dreamed about making video games, but I've kind of given it up. And he said, that's BS. I was your age when I started this and there's nothing stopping you from going and doing that. <laughs> talk about mentorship, talk about having my mind blown having a hero to say, Hey, I see it in you. You can go do it. And I kid you not three months later, I was at my first video game studio. Let's so. jump. Let's jump back before we miss this, because I mean, since we're talking about fatherhood, right? So pretend I'm your dad is you're looking at basic and man, I can't believe you called basic old. Oh, Jay, geez. Ah, I resemble that comment. Um, <laughs> But Didn't want to get too much into Cobalt or assembly language. So. Pascal, yeah, all that, I yeah, I, yeah. I, get it. Um, <laughs> two geeks running along with languages. Um, but if I was your dad back when you were getting into languages, how could I, you know, like have set you up to discover things faster, to support and encourage that, um, you know, you pursuing your dream, right? Now, it doesn't need to be, you know, f- for our kids at home, right? They're not all going to be running in that same direction, but we can take similar steps to support them, encourage them, hear them. Mm-hmm. So let's just step back into me being your dad. Mm-hmm. As your father, what would you have wanted me, you know, now in retrospect, to have done to, to help that dream come about sooner, be fleshed out? Today is a different time than it was back then. And uh, I think that we have so much more access to information. So the answer for today is very different than it was back in the day. It was very normal for the father to apprentice his son or his daughter, for that matter, into whatever the business is. Because there was just like, why not extend and, and pass on your skill set? to the next generation and they they can take it, run with it, make it theirs and take over. But today, really the core thing getting in the way, and this is that principle is that ego. (laughs) You can today at the edge of your fingertips, 
learn absolutely whatever the heck it is that you want to do. My oldest daughter is 11. I'm pretty good at putting together webinars and marketing and doing that kind of stuff. Whenever there's an opportunity, we put together a webinar. This year, one of the things that we did was there was this cookie drive and we built a webinar in the framework to fundraise. I sent that out to my buddies. It was this three to five minute little webinar walking through the steps of the ups and downs of emotion, the ups and downs of uh, fulfilling the product, identifying any issues with it. Like what the, it's like an Otis Spunk Meyer webinar for easy bake cookies, <laughs> right? So really it's, what I, how feel good fathers think about this is this Venn diagram of what do we know how to do? And as the father, the, one of the core skill sets that we need is how to assimilate and find information and teach our kids specifically how to learn. You cannot teach your kids how to learn if you're trying to teach them and control what they do. And that's the essence of ego. So, so then it sounds like the universal truth is that I need to learn as a father those same skills to be able to then pass them along. Is that correct? Or at least enjoy the process of watching them learn. So there's a great sequence in The Incredibles 2, the Disney Pixar movie, where Mr. Incredible is trying to help Jack Jack the speedy one with his math homework. And so initially he does typically how parents teach, which is, well, that's not the way I learned it. I'm going to force the way that I learned math onto you. And then he stays up all night, reads the new math textbook. And he's like, I think I figured this out. Let's do it together. That I've assimilated some of this stuff. I have a much bigger mental model. Let's figure it out and do it together. That's a part we are jumping ahead. That's learning. Let's, let's just get into it. So what that, what that really is all about is that there's something that we call the Hebraic method of fatherhood. And I know that you know this. So here's, here is the pattern. I do it. We do it. You do it. You teach. So your son wants to get into programming video games like I did. Your daughter wants to get into programming or video games like I did. Great. You should go learn as the father a little bit about video game creation. Have a high level overview. Then think a little bit critically. All right. My daughter is great at math, but she's also an artist. So she likes creating art. So what I started with was, all right, let's show her maybe some UI. See some menus. Actually, the first drawing that she made when she was four years old, was actually a video game start menu. So it had like a title, start, continue, load game, settings. And it was just this little UI thing because she was watching me create games and that was an image that she kept seeing. So then once I saw that, I was like, ah, so she thinks about things visually. So then it was like, well, what kind of characters can we make? How kind of, what kind of education? Can I teach her some of the language and lingo about creating art? Now she's kind of taken that competency and understanding digital art, understanding animation, and she watches the vid any games she's playing differently. She watches cartoons differently. She even watches live action things differently and has a different understanding of what's going on because she's thinking, how is something expressed visually right now? She's actually creating comics. She's doing all this kind of stuff. And all of that came, all of that started because I was like, oh, what are you doing? What are you interested in doing? And I just became interested in her. I became curious. Hmm. So that's, the, that's one of the ways that you can really encourage and foster these interests in your kids. Now, the next thing is, and I said, hey, I do. That's how you start. There has to be a capability of you to be able to learn and remember some of this new information. Here is the simple framework for that. 10, 24, seven. Go ahead, Mike. What's the framework? <laughs> 10, 24, seven. <laughs> 10, 24, seven. What that stands for is 10 minutes, 24 hours, seven days. If you want to learn anything and you read something, remind yourself about it 10 minutes later. So if you're in a meeting and you're taking notes, 
read the notes 10 minutes after you leave the meeting. It'll remind you of what you have to learn. You're, uh, it's actually scientifically proven to increase your recall and retention of the information by rereading your notes. So take notes while you're learning something. Review it the next day, 24, 24 hours later. Review it the next day so you've had a sleep. Now, if you're sleeping, your brain is taking short-term memory and putting it into long-term. That's, the fun that's one of the core functions of sleep. That's how we learn. So making sure you're getting your sleep 24 hours later, you're recalling from short and long-term memory and bring it to the forefront so you can think about it. That's 24 seven, seven, seven days. That's your brain saying, this is important. So you're telling your brain that this piece of information is important if you remind yourself about it seven days later, uh, cause it's pulling again from, from your long-term memory and then anchoring it to what's going on. Once you do that framework, now the best way to learn and the best way to really encourage your kids, teaching it. So they want to do something. It doesn't matter what it is. They want to work on cars. They want to make video games. They want to become an accountant. They want to, maybe they want to be a YouTube star. That's like kind of the new thing that kids want to do or a TikTok model or a TikTok thing or a, not a TikTok model, my apologies, fathers, a TikTok star, that kind of stuff or on social media or whatever the new thing is, this is going to be perennial. So whatever the thing is going to be, your kids are going to want to do something, go learn about it, go learn what it takes and then teach them. It'll show and help you build a relationship with your kids because you're showing them that you're listening to them. You're showing them that their voice matters and what they want matters. And then when you come with them with a, here's how you do it, you show them the work involved. And when you walk alongside them, you're building up the confidence so that they can do it themselves. And that is how fathers help their kids thrive. You're becoming dad GPT. <laughs> yeah, dad GPT. I love it. Somebody, somebody trademark that. <laughs> <laughs> um, the other thing, and this is where I individually drop the ball, is when we're helping them to learn and they come to us to share something that they've discovered, take the time and be excited and share in that moment where they've brought something to you saying, look, I learned this. Hey, I want you to be here with me in this. Take the time. It, it may be inconvenient, but share in that because that will build that trust and give you, I would say like a, an, an additional opportunity to continue growing with them and speak to them when they're really looking for it down the road. So the sentence that is honey to a kid's ears is, that's cool. Tell me about that. Yes. A hundred percent. I love that. Tell me about that. What does this mean? Oh, I don't really understand that part. Can you explain it to me? Right. All those that's inquisitive, those inquisitive, like deeper questions, giving them an opportunity to share just creates a, a bigger foundation, a bridge to go forward from there. I think, so, I think there's a innate physiological reaction that we as men have when our kids or the people that are around us activate something passionately through excitement or energy or something like that, that, that you can see it. We're meant to react face to face. We're meant to have these relationships and be excited and it's worth two minutes because your kids will remember, you know what they'll anchor? They'll anchor at that point. My dad cared. <laughs> yeah. It builds that relationship and the, the path for communication. Well, let's press play again on your story. Sure. So, sure. so you were given that kind of, uh, uh, what, you know, opportunity once in a lifetime opportunity where it's like, well, what do you want to do, Jay? Like, where did things continue from there, um, in, in growing for you and, and getting you down the path? Absolutely. Uh, thanks so much for, for that reminder. So what I realized from that conversation with Kevin Sambida when he said, hey, I was your age when I started, you can do it too, was that he was already interacting with me from an identity. And he was seeing, he was saying, oh, well, you intended this thing to be as a creator of an IP and as a creator of a system and something that he wanted to create his business. He saw that I had that desire to go create something. So he was identifying as an activity as, as an identity with me. And the, the truth about identities is that identities really, most of us think it's this internal element. It's this internal perspective that we have, but identity by definition is how you relate to other people. 
And identity is the act of choices that you make in every moment as it relates to other people. So identity is an active thing. So what I did then is I was reminded of this identity that I had since I was in elementary school that I wanted to make games. And I went and I said, oh, okay. And we just talked about learning. I literally, for those three months, I learned everything I could about making video games. Everything. I learned about game analytics. I learned about game creation. I went through a David Perry. It was a 50 game challenge. Now at this time, there was no Netflix. There was games weren't really online. Like some of these portals and stuff like that didn't exist. So it was all, there was a Netflix-esque game service. I, I totally forget what it was called, but you would put the game in and they would send you the disc. And so it was like, play the top 50 rated games of all time. Very meaningful if you want to learn about game analytics and recreating your own games and, and to digest it in eight different categories. What was great about them? So the active choices that I was making, well, okay, well, I'm going to be a game developer. I'm going to make games. I ended up becoming a game system designer, rule sets, math, uh, player controls, that kind of jazz. And I needed to learn to analyze these different games about what they were doing that was successful. And it was creating a different vocabulary. It was game literacy. What were the little tricks? So here's, so here's this funny little trick that I learned. I was playing the GoldenEye game on Nintendo 64. In the opening sequence of the movie, you're there, he's walking through that bridge in like Russia or whatever, and he's running across it. Well, in the game, you do the same thing. You walk across that, oh, so it was a dam. It was a dam that he walked across. Mm -hmm. And my mind had told me that as I was running through the level, that the background was moving. And what I realized when I looked at it, like I actually stopped and looked at it, the background doesn't move. It's a static image, but there's enough movement in the foreground that it gives this really cool illusion. And then, I, and then so what that taught me is about, oh, there are certain kind of savings and tricks that can create the illusion of motion, the illusion without the actuality. That was kind of one, one skill there. But I think, I think what we really want to talk about is identity. And so identity, uh, it's broken up. There's a, the compass framework of identity for fathers, which is what we'll talk about after a minute. But I want to break down the philosophical terms as it comes to what really is this little exercise you can do to figure out what your identity is. So there's the ethos, pathos, and logos. So the ethos, ethos is what you believe, what your message is, what your purpose is going out into the world, values and beliefs. Your pathos, this is your heart and your emotional story. What is, what's the story that you're telling yourself about your life? Critically important. Then your logos, which is your logo, logical reasoning, or as we say, what's the truth? What's the evidence that you have for any of this to be real? So let's jump a little bit into sort of these ethos area, like your beliefs and message. So we talked about personal branding. That is at the center of personal brand. What is your method, meth, message? What is it that you believe to be true about the world? We have this term called your vantage point. What is it that you see to be true for the people that you're serving? So I always ask myself, what is it that I see to be true about the world for feel good fathers that they don't yet see? And so as it comes to this identity, what I'm telling you feel good fathers is that you can have your own identity. You just have to make active choices in it. Don't be responsive. Don't be reactive. You pick what it is and you make consistent choices in that belief and value set. The value set is more defined down in the compass. We'll get into that in just a minute. Pathos, your emotional story. What is the story that you tell yourself about your upbringing? What's the story that you tell yourself about yourself, your family, your wife, your children? What's the story that you're saying? What, how are you? Are you looking at the negative side and always kind of in frustration? Or are you grateful for them? Are you excited to be spending time with them? There's an active choice we can, we can make in regards to the emotions that we apply to the story of what happened. So I've had, when I was young, I'm not going to get into too many details. I had a major medical incident between 80, uh, 2008 and 2009. And so that to me galvanized a mission of serving men that particular moment in time. It could have been something different. I could have made, oh, woe is me. I had this surgery, all this other kind of stuff. Like it could have been something different, but I chose specifically to turn that into fuel, to be super grateful that it happened because it really helped me learn 
what was meaningful about masculinity and meaningful about being a man. And I turned that, that logic and that learning into lessons today. So what's the story? You break this down to three core pieces. What happened in the past and what's the story that you tell yourself about them, about it. So two people in the world sitting in a room hearing one message, both have a different thing they're taking, about, taking from it. One being an opportunity, one being victimhood. Everything in life you can view as an opportunity. It's something that fueled you. And I'm telling you this, everything that happened in your life happened for a reason. And you are the person you are today because of everything that happened then. That so how, past. go ahead. Sorry, Jay. How do you, when you're just going day to day, Jay, mm-hmm. you're doing your best to survive in the moment, right? Mm-hmm. I've got work that's going on. When I'm at work, I'm thinking about what I need to be doing at home. When I'm at home with the kids and the wife, I'm thinking about what I need to be doing at work. And I'm struggling to be present, much less to look forward or backwards, except for those those limiting beliefs, right? The doubts that I have about myself, the things that may keep me down. How do you go from that to getting to understanding your ethos and your pathos and, and being able to understand, um, you know, it's not just a thought, but this is something that's keeping me almost in an identity prison, right? Mm. I'm playing small because I believe these small beliefs, right? You set your dream aside. You've shared that. Many men have done the same. They've also set aside their belief of who they can be, that larger man right? As a father, a husband, just who I am in my own skin. How do you walk through it? Or maybe how did you walk through it to discover and really lay that out to be clear on, on how to move forward and become that man with those new beliefs? Perfect. A lot of it has to do with those active choices that I mentioned. And there's a specific set of choices or activities you can do given the three core stories that you tell yourself, past, present, and future. And so here's here's the reality because we're kind of stumping into the present, which is really what your present story has to deal with, which is I'm at home thinking about work, I'm at work thinking about home. The here's the un here's the here's the direct, straightforward truth. You're just not dealing. If you're doing that you're not dealing with the thing that you have to deal with. You're just avoiding what's happening. You're not dealing with conflicts. You're not dealing with your thoughts. You're not dealing with your feelings about what's happening at work. You're doing the same thing at home. And so what you're, what you're doing is you're just kind of avoiding the work that needs to happen in them. A simple statement that happens a lot is just being grateful. Starting with gratitude, starting with awe. Every single morning I wake up and I look at the sunrise, period. I watch the sun go over the horizon. Doesn't matter if I'm traveling all over the world. Doesn't matter if I'm sitting in my home, my living room specifically, and my coffee chair specifically looks at the horizon and I watch the sunrise. And I'm just grateful. I'm grateful to watch those wonderful golden rays really fill me with awe and inspiration. I'm thankful to God. I'm thankful for my life. I'm thankful for all the decisions that have got me where I am today that I get to sit down and experience my morning coffee watching, watching that. Anchor yourself in something that you're grateful for. The next step is really, like seriously, start doing the work. Part of being a functional adult is the fact that there are going to be things that give you emotional highs and there's gonna be things that give you emotional lows. And that's a function of life. Life is struggle. It is. Look at a plant. Plants can grow through concrete. Life is struggle. That's just a function of it. You're going to have struggle. You got to deal with it and you got to accept it. And now remember when we were talking about the story that you tell yourself? All of your struggles in your life are in your past. I'm going to say that one more time. All of the struggles that you have in your life are in your past because it's the story that you're telling yourself about that struggle that's determining your present quality. Was it an opportunity or was it a victim thing? Were you grateful that that thing happened because it showed you more of who you are? 
when you work out and you flex your muscles, you get bigger and you get stronger. It's a function of something that you did in the past. And the result of your body is that you might be stronger for putting in that effort yesterday. So who you are today is based on what happened. That's, that's true everywhere. Your performance at your work is based on the thing that you learned, the knowledge you attained and applied in the past. Almost nothing that is almost, almost nothing that you're doing right now in the present moment has to do with um, what's actually happening in the moment. Almost all of it is fueled by the past. So treating it as positive fuel to, to feed this identity and accepting what's happening right then and being present, that's really how you solve that equation. So the first is identifying and becoming aware of the story that you tell yourself. And then the great thing is this, is that if you have a story you're telling yourself and you don't like it, you can retell yourself a different story. It's mm -hmm. your brain, it's your mind, it's your emotions. Radical, radical accountability, radical ownership. That's how you solve that specific example you're talking about. That's pretty much how you solve just about everything. So it's not a one and done. This is something I'll revisit and continue to get different perspectives on things that happen and look at things differently as well as I gain power, as I gain a different vantage point to look at things and have gratitude. You're saying that this is something that I'll see things differently and this is like an ongoing process. So prepare to be patient, have patience with myself and, and be gracious to myself as well. Is that right? It's exactly. And it's similar to lifting weights in the beginning. It's really tough because you're building your body. You're building this muscle of doing this work and reflecting on what's happening around you. And you don't have to know or do everything right. And that's the, that's the crazy thing, right? If you think back to when you were a kid and you were learning how to walk, you fell all the time. You probably fell on your butt a whole bunch. And if you had great parents, they were just kind of like, great, keep going. It's yes, keep like, that's what I'm doing with my youngest right now. It's like, keep walking around, let's go. You know, she, she'll bump, she'll fall on her butt. And it's kind of like, I stand in front of her and I just say, uh, come here. Like this is, this, she kind of does like up, up. That's what she does. So I'm just like, come on, come to me to get her to stand up, to get her to, um, she fell down to get back up and keep going. Well, um, the more and more you do that, the more and more you lift weights, the more and more you do this work and you reflect, not only does the time, like not only does that time gap decrease, so you get better at that skill, um, you're also rewriting because you're intentionally setting what your present moment is. You're telling yourself your story. So that's kind of, that's that. It gets better. Patient, if you're starting today, great. Like here's, here's the, there's like the geeky version of how this works. And there's like the personal development version. So here's the geeky version. I love anime. I absolutely love anime. I love the Japanese story because the hero in all Japanese animes puts a crap ton of work into themselves to get better. They're not getting a bigger gun, which is usually the American version. They're not getting the cohort. They're not getting the gang. They're not doing that kind of stuff. They're putting the time in to make themselves better. There's this wonderful sequence in the first or second season of Demon Slayers absolutely gorgeous Japanese ad anime based on famous Japanese paint paintings. And he's got to, in order to satisfy the, um, the challenge of the current mentor, he has to, the main character has to slice through a boulder with his sword. Now, physics wise, it's really tough to take a katana and slice through a boulder. Usually the katana loses. But eventually, and like you watch the diorama of him doing this work and it finally gets to the point where I think it's like he, the unlock is like if he feels it and he drives with that emotion, just that emotional literacy, that emotional understanding that fathers need to have, that he activates the passion that he's able to slice the boulder. Hmm. Like it's just like go back in time to like Dragon Ball Z and Goku. Like he's constantly working on himself to make him stronger and he's getting better and better by overcoming different challenges. Like that's, that's a story. It's radical self Kaizen. So Japanese anime, that's the geeky version. All of your heroes in all these fictional worlds, they're working on themselves. My absolute favorite story. And I'm watching the, the TV series, but I read the book series multiple times. All 14 books is the wheel of time. Rand goes through an absolutely incredible journey from being a nobody farmer 
His father teaches him one or two core skills that allow him to focus. And they, he starts with as an archer. They allow him to really focus and be a great archer, similar to like Robin Hood in that kind of world. And then he grows into this, the, the leader of the free world fighting against darkness. It's, and what an incredible journey he goes through, but it's all this personal, he's personally developing and he goes through a dark time. He has light time. He has good stuff. He has bad stuff. He loses his hand, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you, Robert Jordan. Uh, <laughs> so that's the, that's the geeky side and all these fictional stories, what I call modern mythology, it can tell you and provide for you a roadmap on how to get to the point where you want to be. Cause we all want to be great. That's it's the, the universal message of manhood and masculinity. We all want to be great. We all want to contribute. We want to be ahead of our household. We all want to be powerful and not like power over. We want to have power over our own life. We want to have that agency. We want to have that control. And the single best place that you can learn that the start of it all is in your mind. So for those of you listening, I'm pointing at my head, having control of your thoughts or influence over them. So understanding what are the thoughts that are you, your conscious thoughts versus your unconscious thoughts. Mindfulness meditation, go check it out. It's really good. What are your emotions? That's just emotional literacy. You don't have to react when you have an emotion. That's the, the core principle of actually a lot of different things. It's in the Bible. It's in Stoicism. It's in actually most modern religions, most modern philosophies. This understanding of a separation of the emotion you're feeling inside and your reaction. So increasing the gap between feeling something and reacting to that something. Um, and then uh, there's the physical side, having the body that you want, taking care of it, fueling it. Like your mind does what your body does. So if your body's, if you're working on your body and you're doing squats and when you wake up in the morning and a handful of sit-ups and push-ups, you're going to be much more prepared for the day than if you're not. You're going to feel much better if you're eating nutritious foods, fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, good sources of protein as you will if you eat chips and McDonald's. Please don't come after me McDonald's. You know what I know is true. <laughs> oh, man. <clears throat> so this gets, so where we were is we got the past story and the present story. Now we get the future story. And here's the great thing about your future story is that we talked a lot about emotions and understanding your emotions your future story and the emotions you feel about that story are fuel that will change the decisions that you're making today. Because what you're doing is you're setting your brain to look for opportunities about what you want to see in the future. The more detail you have, the more emotion you have associated with what you want to create, the more detail and the more you'll see and your brain will put together the path forward for you to attain that future story. So that the exercise with the future story is writing basically, I call it, it's the future letter from five years in the, in the, in the, in the future, specifically detail exactly what it is you want. People underestimate what they can accomplish. And so sure, if you're, you know, but there have been examples of people that are homeless nobodies that go to multimillionaires in five years, but here's, here's the reality of this challenge is a lot of people think they want money, status, and fame. A lot of people don't want money, status, and fame. A lot of people really want better quality relationships, a better life, more intentional living, more control and agency over their thing, probably a little bit less debt, probably a little bit more comfort and, and income. If, you're, if your real goal, just, and, and here's the thing, if, the, if your real goal is to become an entrepreneur and do that kind of stuff, number one, do the personal branding free call. Just do that. Number two, you're a part of like the top one to 2% and you're going to need to do work like the top one or 2% to make that reality. If that excites you, do the call. If it doesn't excite you, hey, get better at what you're doing. Or flesh out your dream a little more mm -hmm. because it may be something like, a man, when I look back, Jay, one, I was a chameleon to whomever was around. Right. I lost mm -hmm. myself in feeling secure in uncomfortable situations because of how I saw myself. And I'd also set aside my dream. So beginning to dream again in light of not knowing who I was, 
man, it took some time to flesh those things out. And so that may be something you want, but it may not be the thing for now. Um, and it may be, hey, I don't want to be an entrepreneur, I but I want to be a brand. I want to be seen as a thought leader within my current industry, right? Whether you're in gaming, you're in IT, where, whatever industry, it may look different, but there is still, like you've talked about, that branding component. It doesn't mean you have to step out on your own, but you still need to know what you're about and where you're going. And so being patient, putting in the work and persevering to see who you are and what you do want and begin like seeing those truths about what's gone on are game changers. I'm curious about you. You spoke about, uh, you know, being clear on where you want to go, right? Writing that letter. And you had talked about uh, 10, 24, seven, do those have like a crossing? Do you implement something along those same lines in keeping that top of mind and rereading it so that it doesn't fade away kind of into the sunset um, or become buried under all the demands of our day-to-day -day life? Is that something like you keep fresh and continue to look at and uh, almost reignite? 100%. Once you write your future story letter to yourself, you should read that every day. Hmm. That's it. Feel the emotions, read it every day. That can become part of your morning routine when you're waking up with coffee, like me. Uh, if you really wanna if you really wanna accelerate it, I would read it in the morning. So your your brain is looking for opportunities to create that letter. And then I would reflect, read it at night, and then if you really wanna accelerate write down what you did that day to make that a reality. And if the best thing that you did to make that a reality that day was I read my letter, good on you. So since we're talking about fatherhood, how do you suggest or how have you experienced um, most, you know, optimally bringing your fatherhood focus into that letter? Is there a way to, uh, be mindful and intentional about it? Or is it just kind of something you set off to the side? So my journey at this is we're dipping into sort of the, the fatherhood compass, the fatherhood values compass. And one of the core principles there was knowing who you didn't want to be. And so I talk a lot about who you want to be and who you don't want to be. And that's your East and West. So, um, your East is sort of your attraction. What do you want most? So that's the, the future story kind of really is moving into that space. What do you want most is the high end, the high energy version of your East attraction. The low energy version is what are you willing to sacrifice to get there? So when I'm thinking about fatherhood, specifically to answer your question, a lot of my drive was what I didn't want to be. And later on, what I realized was that, um, and this kind of comes from, if we think about the 10 commandments in the Bible, right? And my pastor did a really great job of explaining this to me, was that the 10 commandments are written in the way that they are very specifically and intentionally. They're things that you shouldn't do because the implication is there's a bunch of, a bunch of things that you must do, right? Thou shalt not kill means thou shalt value life. So what it, and so, what it does is that it ended up okay because I knew who I didn't want to be from an identity perspective. And so that was really a lot of anger. I didn't want to be resentful. I didn't want to, I didn't want that classic fatherhood, angry father example to be me. So I had to create the other side. So I had the negative, what I was moving away from on the East, that traction towards what I wanted and I had to define myself. Feel good fatherhood ultimately is about peace, being at peace with myself, who I am, being at peace with myself and my identity as a husband, being at peace with my identity as a father, being at peace with my identity at work, being at peace with my identity as it relates to my community, being at peace, et cetera, et cetera. And so that goes out all the way to the universal, the universal level, which is being at peace with my identity as it relates to creator, God, whatever the heck. <laughs> whatever the heck, however your persuasion is, whatever that happens to be. 
So there's that who I want to be, who I don't want to be. And part of my letter was about the kind of relationship that I had with my wife, with the mother of my children, right? And they're the same person. Some people they're not, but for me, they're the same person. My wife and the mother of my children are the same person. And uh, the relationship I want to have with my kids. And so because I had that and I knew that, it really just, my reflection is, okay, well, did I do this today? So was, was I that person? Was I full of peace? Was I full of love? Was I full of curiosity? Have I helped my daughters develop more of an identity? Have I been this thing? You know, it's, it, some fathers like being the goofy play dad. It's like, great, cool, go be the, go do that. Some, some fathers a little bit more of the thriving creation d- discipline dad. Great, go do that. That's all good. Like it's, it's just about, are you doing the thing to create that? Are you like, are you doing those activities? Cause identity is active. Are you making the choices to be that identity? And that creates peace in you. Cause it, cause you end up trusting yourself. Cause you're saying I wanted to do this and I did it. Therefore I trust myself. And then you become trustworthy to yourself, trustworthy to your spouse. That's the most significant relationship you have in your life. And then it kind of goes on from there. And speaking of your spouse Hmm. is, are you talking with your wife to get her input? I know for me personally, dude, there's times where I'm like, I'm seeing clear and I've got blinders on Jay. I think we're all guilty of that at some level. Hmm. Are you inviting like men that you trust, um, like your wife to say like, Hey, what do you see that I'm, not seeing like where am I doing things that are harmful to myself or others um what would you like to see that you know maybe um you know they see a better version of you or I right um what do you see that I'm not fully stepping into are you inviting them to have input to that or are you doing it kind of like in a silo um just off of your emotions and insights um, in and of itself. Great, great clarification. Your identity is the actions that you take in relation to other people. You have to share this in your goals and you have to invite accountability into your life. There's a fundamental difference between asking somebody to be accountable to you and who you are versus a critic and being able to discern the difference and you know, technically be assertive enough to say, well, this is what I want. This is what I don't want. This is how I'd like to be communicated. This is how I'd like to keep you accountable. That's also part of the equation as well. So yes, if you are married, you absolutely must enroll your wife or your husband, whatever, or whatever. There's a whole thing. Now you must enroll that spouse into precisely who you are and who you want to be. Because this gets it, we're getting into a little bit of the relationship pillar, but especially for your spousal relationship, there's three entities. Um, if you're going to do the Christian world, there's a fourth. We don't want to talk about that right now, but we'll add it at the end. But there's three entities that need to be managed in that relationship. You and what you want, what your wife wants, who she is and what she wants. But the most significant relationship there is the relationship itself. So the here's the unfortunate truth. Sometimes you win. Sometimes she wins and that's an immature relationship. But most of the time you should be making decisions so that the relationship wins. And over time, and I'm I'm telling you fathers, I'm telling you this. If you make more decisions based on what's great for the relationship, boy, oh boy, will you reap that? Will you reap what you sow in a very positive, enlightening and intimate manner? And when she sees what you're doing and she's going to activate, she's going to start doing the same things. And that like, you're going to have a fantastic marriage with a great person and that's engaged in both of your individual identities. Now she doesn't have to do the same work you're doing. Um, it's a different kind of relationship, but you know, like this is really going to help you by making more decisions that are better for the marriage. And this gets into things like if you're married, don't go to a strip club. If you're married, stop going out to the single bar with your single buddies. If you're married, you know, um, let's see, what are some other things? Stop, I don't know, like stop looking at 
suggestive, suggestive images of, of women. Um, definitely stop looking at porn. These are just core activities that increase your intimacy with your wife or your spouse. I'm, gonna, I'm just going to default to spouse to wife because, you know, I have a wife. So that's it. Like you stop looking at that stuff. You're facing your wife. And here's yes. the thing. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. So yes, there's that accountability from that spousal relationship, but the other side, and this is that critical, we were talking about the problem that men don't have enough relationships. You need to enroll and surround yourself by other men that see you, understand your identity and want to help you get there. That's, and that's critical. And if, here's the reality of this is that the vast majority of time, you need to be very intentional about who speaks into your life and who you let into your house. This is your personal identity house. So this is really a big piece of the work of the Feel Good Fatherhood community. This is an invite only group of men and we hold each other accountable to what we want to create. I'm personally a part of a mastermind that holds me accountable. That's a different group. And I have that Feel Good Fatherhood community mastermind. That's what it's all about. It's about that engaging people in what you want to be about. Mike's a part of this group. He helps me. He understands what my mission is and he calls me into being. Yeah. And there's certain things that we just don't see, or if we see it, we just become numb to it almost like we become uh, complacent and let it go. What you were talking about, like the relationship with your wife, man, this was something I never expected, Jay, but I, when I invested and studied, right, you talked about being analytical. When I studied my wife and our relationship, it created this foundation that then as far as the fatherhood, man, the kids were more secure. And that peace, when the kids are secure, you have a thriving uh, relationship, do that peace comes just by a default and you don't have to force it. It naturally blooms and grows out of that environment. So yeah, I love the fact of, you know, looking for the men to help you be more supportive, more engaged, right? Both with your wife and with your children. Um, they feed off of each other, <laughs> which wasn't something I expected at all. It was like, huh, this is an amazing byproduct. I love it. Let's go. <laughs> you, you need to, it, it's, I love it. I, I completely agree. You know, the, um, your kids are going to follow you. You're your first example for everything your kids want in their life. And so they're going to follow you and your, and your wife. That's it. Like that's, that's just the reality. That's the truth. And your kids are a fantastic mirror. They show up, they, they show your behaviors, they show your issues, your mannerisms, everything. Your kids are the best and worth of both, of both you and your mom uh, and the mom. That's, that's the truth. Now, here's another reality that took me a long time to learn. And I, and I think it's, it's meaningful is that there are some things that you need to have like with your wife. And there are some things that a men's group is better for and just understanding sort of the position and honor that the different people in your life get, that's really critical. So for instance, if, if you're religious or a Christian, you're going to have probably more discussions with your pastor or your priests about your spiritual battles. And guess what? You probably should keep your spiritual battles to that, that person in your life that's helping you through them. I would absolutely let, let your wife know what's going on. But if you're doing a spiritual battle thing, like that's the primary person over there is going to help you with it. In the same way that like, it doesn't help you to ask your wife for the raise when you're trying to get a promotion at work. There's different people have different roles and understanding who your wife is to you. Cause here, here's the thing. There's different people have different things. Some married couples have a business together. So they have a different kind of relationship than people that don't have a business together, a different kind of relationship than, uh, you know, one working spouse versus a non-working spouse. So like there's tons of different versions of this, but you have to understand and know at the end of the day that your spouse is your lover, um, should probably be your best friend. Um, but they also have different things that they're accomplishing and they don't have to accomplish everything. You should not lean on your spouse for everything. They should know everything that's happening in your life, but they shouldn't help you solve everything. A lot of these things you got to be able to do yourself or yeah. pick, pick the right accountability partners for it. Yeah. 
know know what to share and when to share yes. and how to share it yes um and show up i mean if we're expecting our wives to show up for us in support we need to also be willing to show up for them in support because just as we hit challenges they'll hit challenges and that continues to like like strengthen that relationship it fuels it and just like you would you know you talked about a katana right to strengthen that katana it's got to be heated up and put under the pressure of of that uh that hammer i can't think of the right term for it uh, in the forge the pressure of the forge yep. no when it's being hammered out um anyways yeah when it's you know i mean it's oh, being folded. put under pressure in multiple ways right yeah yep that pressure while it's uncomfortable is what really strengthens the relationship and uh yeah dude like being able to come in with grace and support as we're expecting to be supported and you know wanting it desiring it um i think is crucial so like what what else within this past year like when you look at it has you know, you've got other men that are investing in you. Mm -hmm. You're stepping out, you're doing new things, right? That learning component is there. Mm -hmm. What else did you see like in this last year that you learned and then implemented um, that caused like, uh, you know, a stronger relationship as a dad? Um, mm -hmm. What what else contributed to that change within this past year? I learned... And this is kind of funny. I learned that there's a lot I don't know. And there's a lot of things I'm not good at. And I really came to accept, number one, that I don't have to be good at it. This directly relates to the north point of your the fatherhood compass, which is you have something inside you that's absolutely unique. There's something that you are the best in the world at. And when you're received at your best, so there's something about that. And through having these 54 interviews, what I saw was a 54 different men that were really good at whatever it is that they were talking about. And they had thought about it. They become experts at it. They know the process about it. They know how to accomplish it. And it's amazing to watch. And surrounding yourself by people that not only are experts in whatever it is that they're doing, but that also see that you are an expert in what you're doing, that that's like, there's some magic there. And so... That humility there of kind of catching up my internal view of how other people perceive me. That was a big, a big piece, a big piece of what I learned um, at, at a high level. And so that's sort of the North Point. On the South Side, boy, oh boy, <laughs> the South Side, the South Point of your compass, that's your dark side. So my dark side, in the similar to uh, Winston Churchill, he called his depression Black Dog. Mine is Black Dragon. Every once in a while, Black Dragon rears his head and he's hanging out. And this is really those questions, when are you at your worst? When are your strengths applied in the wrong way? So I've done the uh, Sally Hogg's head. Um, it's like the personality test that she's got. And for me, it's passion and power. That's when I'm really activated. And so those are kind of the way that I, those are my, my two, uh, I, I totally forget what it's called, captivating personality or something like that. And um, it's possible to activate my passion and power in a negative energy to put somebody down. And this can show up as jealousy, anger, resentment. It doesn't matter. And I think that one of the functions of growing Let's go, let's use that analogy of like building your muscles and weightlifting. Your muscles are going to be sore. So when it comes to personal development and leveling up and becoming a better person, becoming a better man, becoming a better father, you got to deal with your dark side because that's the pain. That's the pain of the growth is that you shed the way that I described this when I was doing the confidence coaching when I was younger was over time you've put these band-aids over you to protect you from pain and hurt in the world. And they can manifest as bad personality uh, elements. They can manifest as bad thoughts, mindset. They can 
manifest as um, resentments or mindset issues. As you, as you identify them and you identify that you have a bandage over you, you like over time, people start looking like a mummy. You've got to sort of rip off the band-aids and show who you are. That's your identity. That's your North Star. But you have to acknowledge that there's a South. And I have a lot of reservation whenever I meet somebody that's always positive all the time. Because what I see is somebody that's not willing to acknowledge that they have a dark side. And, and part of being a balanced, peaceful person is really understanding that like you are kind of a monster. There's a lot of capability that most people have that they're not even realize it, you know? And uh, one of the stoic philosophies and even Winston Churchill said, if you find yourself in hell, keep freaking going because you'll get out on the other side. So if you're struggling and things are coming up and you're dealing with drama and trauma and all this kind of stuff, just keep going, keep doing the work, keep writing the past story, keep writing the present story, keep doing the future story, keep focus on these things because it will get resolved. And you will you will come out better on the other side. So that's the other thing I learned um, was really kind of getting more in touch with this dark side of me, this black dragon that kind of rears head. And in the same way that as you shorten that gap between identifying, hey, this thing happened and it's not my identity, it's not who I want to be, the more and more you're able to acknowledge your dark side, the quicker you can stop it the quicker you can say, oh, that's not my identity because that because identity is a choice. I don't want that side. I don't want the dark side to, to reign. We talked about attraction, what you want most. That's the east side. And then the final the final one is the west side. This is very related to the, to the south side because the east attraction is what do you want most? What are you moving towards? Well, the west is where are you hiding? It's what are you doing to hide? Uh, and again, I said, what bandages are you using to cover yourself up? So that's that self-awareness piece. It's like, are you putting up a front to prevent yourself from being hurt? Are you putting up a front to hide your actual vulnerability? I have a great friend. He uses humor and personality and is very entertaining and he has crippling self-doubt. <laughs> so he's got this personality that he's developed, which is his West side which has become a north side. So this is that how that works, is that he, it, it's become, he's developed his personality to protect himself, right? To protect this insecurity that he has, but it's become this uniqueness. It's become this great personality trait. It's become this very attractive expertise that he has. And it, so it's become this north side. So there's two ways, right? You can say, hey, I don't want this. I don't want to hide this self-doubt. But then there's the, then there's the, well, I like actually who I am because identity is a choice. I like who I am. So I'm going to make that my North and continue to do the work. I happen to know that he's not hiding in this entertaining, funny world, that he's actually doing this a lot of, a lot of work together to, to make himself the most meaningful po possible. So life is full of juxtapositions and dichotomies and opposite ends of the spectrum. And you have the capability in, in all of them. You have positive and negative in all of them. So the number one thing I learned, again, I'm not an expert in everything. And there's a heck of a lot of experts out there that want to help. Uh, acknowledging the fact that I don't need to be an expert in everything. I just need to be really good at me. Learning where I'm running, running away, what my resentments are. What are the things that I guess the, the term is triggering me? I, I just say what upsets me what activates my negative emotions, understanding that, and then doing the work to decide that that's not who I am and I want to be somebody different. I think that that putting myself out there, which is a huge, that's a huge West Side story for me, is I don't want to be in the limelight. I want to be the light's crew chief, which is something I did in high school. I don't want to be on stage. I don't want to be up front. It, it's very hard for me to do that because it's not a part of this identity that I had for the longest time. And now I'm doing the opposite. Yeah, it sounds almost like uh, don't run from leg day, right? If we're back at the gym, right. it's like don't skip <laughs> leg day because then uh, you're going to show up at the uh, competition and be wearing jeans, not shorts, and just like look at my upper body. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. kind of go back to your workout analogy. So it's important to focus and do the work on our muscles, but it's also important to give a time for rest. 
what's something in the last year that you've learned, hey, I need to, you know, rest or invest in a, like a down state that a year ago you weren't aware of? The question is here is that Pareto principle. What's the one simple thing you can do as frequently as possible that fills your bucket? And I told this story about how in the morning, every morning, I sit and I watch the sunrise, even when I'm traveling. I watch the sunrise. And so that to me is this little, if I do this one thing, this is the Pareto, the Pareto principle activity that makes the rest of the day great. So watch the sunrise, then read my future story. Get calibrated with who I am and what I want to create. And then everything else is, you know, extra. Like I love working out. I feel great when I work out. I worked out before I came on the air here, right? That, that is priming the body, giving me energy. Uh, the meditation of watching the sunrise and taking that quiet moment is critical. So those are sort of the daily activities, the daily down and rest states. But the next one is taking vacations, <laughs> just taking time away and setting up an empty present where you don't have to, where you can just reflect. I remember when in about 2014 or 2016, uh, my wife and I left San Diego. Now we are from the North. So put us under eight feet of snow and we'll figure it out. We're okay. But when there's a fire breathing dragon that's cresting the mountain and San Diego has fires all the time, that's a different thing that my wife and I were not prepared for. So <laughs> my wife noped out, I believe it was 2016 in that there was a San Diego fire that was happening in Rancho Bernardo because there was a mountain that was nearby that we could see from our home. And I, I kid you not, it was crested by fire. Like the mount, like it looked like one of those crazy paintings where there was like a snake running down the mountain. And she was like, I'm good. I'm gone. <laughs> so she packed up the baby and flew out. So a lot of like a lot, like the company, the video game company I was working at had closed all this kind of jazz. And in that moment, I didn't necessarily have time to rest. But what I did have was I was driving my car across the country because I was going from San Diego to New York. So I was driving up there. I stopped in Chicago first to see my sister. She was living there at the time. And then across to Detroit, then across to uh, where I was in Albany. Uh, Detroit was my best friend. So um, those, I think it was like five or six days from basically San Diego through to Chicago. I was just with myself processing, processing my career, processing video games, processing all the things that had happened, processing... Um, there's this critical moment uh, where I knew that my identity was changing. And it was this regular day at work where I had, I was working at the dream studio, Sony online entertainment. And I had played EverQuest growing up and I was working on EverQuest, EverQuest game. And um, I went to work. It was a regular day. There was no crunch, no overtime, no nothing. So I was out of the house and my oldest daughter was asleep. Went to work, regular day came back, no traffic. And I walked in the house and she was already in bed. And I, we were in a condo at the time and I walked up the stairs and I woke her up so I could sing her a lullaby. And when I went down to relax for the evening at the end of the day, there was so much going on. <laughs> there was just a lot of discomfort that I was feeling, a lot of um, I was confused. I didn't really understand what was happening. And it's because the act of choice that I was making there, I was a new father. My oldest daughter was between one and two years old. The act of choice that I was making was an old identity. The act of choice that I was making in that moment was this older video game professional that was putting, would regularly put in crunch hours, would regularly just work a lot of overtime. And even though it was a regular day, I knew, shit, if I miss this on a regular day, what the hell am I gonna be missing when I'm crunching? And I knew that was on the horizon. It took me years to figure this out. 
it just, it just took me a long time to figure it out. But that drive across that rest and recuperation allowed me to sort of process like, oh man, I, I don't want to do that anymore. I don't want to crunch anymore. I don't want to sacrifice. I, I didn't even realize it, but I had become unconsciously a family man facing my family, caring about my daughter, caring about my wife and understanding and being uh, really excited about what they were accomplishing. I can remember the anguish that my, my wife felt when we were in San Diego. This was before the, this was like a month or two before the forest fire happened. The company I was working at closed. I had been a part of about seven startups at this stage in my life. And that company at that time closed and I had to, and she was, I was home when she came home and she was like, shit, what happened? You're not supposed to be home right now. And I had to break her heart. And we had finally built this wonderful world in San Diego. And like a month later, it was capped off with a, there's a dragon cresting the mountain, get the F out. <laughs> so so um, I think like to your rest and recuperation thing, it's that we have to be willing to sit with our emotion. And we have to be willing to pay attention to ourselves to make that that really good decision moving forward. And this is what I can promise you is that there are more millionaires in the world than there are video game developers. So I've done something that not a lot of people have done. There are more people that have wealth and rich and that kind of lifestyle than the things that I've done. And I'm looking right now on my wall, there's a Stan Lee signed Marvel poster from the second game I ever made. It's the only one in existence. The dev team signed it. It's the video game poster and Stan Lee signed it. And I was lucky because I was the right person at the right time. And um, I asked for the right thing and it happened because I just made that request. And I promise you that if you do this work in the stories, if you identify your compass, you figure out what your values are, your ethos, your pathos, your logos, if you understand all this kind of stuff and you're willing to do the work and you face your family, that you can have this great life as a feel-good father, as a feel-good parent, as a feel-good whatever the hell. You can have this great, peaceful life that you've created and the satisfaction that you will feel will blow you away. And that's the feel-good fatherhood promise. <laughs> That is a lot to process. Just as you talked about driving across, you know, the U.S., this has been a journey of what to process to get to being that feel-good fatherhood, you know, like state, right? Just like you've talked about the three different places of our past, our present, our future, um, learning, analyzing, and then the resting and reflection and being self-aware. It's a lot to, a lot to process, Jay. And uh, I think it's going to take patience, perseverance, and time, just being gracious with ourselves to continue fleshing that out. But the rewards, I mean, we're reflecting on a year. If we continue to do that year after year, the rewards and the dividends, just we can't fathom them, you know, at this at this phase. So it's continue pressing in. And Jay, again, I want to say congratulations. A year ago, you launched a dream. The impact has been absolutely amazing. Not just for you, but for the listeners, for the guests that you've invited on. This has had a reach and an impact. I don't think when we were talking about it over a year ago, that we could imagine at that time, man. So congratulations on continuing to persevere, invest, and just now standing back and looking at what the rewards are. So congratulations, my friend. Thank you. It's a, it's a great privilege to be able to serve men and fathers. It's, I, I really do this for really for the, the people and the things that I want to see in the world. Cause I think that more men and more fathers that the world gets better as we deal with our own issues, as we step into our identities and we author and have more agency in our life. So Thank you, listeners. Thank you, Feel Good Fathers. Thank you for the supporters. I appreciate you. I see you. I watch you because I have analytics. <laughs> so <laughs> I look at that. And um, thank you so much for listening.